Imagine if the gay rights movement had said, we're here, we're queer, and there's no such thing as penises or vaginas. You said, what? You, you, you're saying what? To get Brexit. Make America great again. No, no, no. Hello, this is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray is one of the leading thinkers of our times. He is an author and a journalist, author of The Madness of Crowds and The Strange Death of Europe. We're going to be talking all about those two books and how the world has changed since they were published. Douglas Murray, thank you very much for joining us. So since your book, uh, The Strange Death of Europe, was published in 2017, we've seen Brexit. Obviously, we, ha we had the vote in Brexit in 2016, but now we finally left the European Union. And it looked for a time that that wasn't going to happen. So has your view of the strange death of Europe, any of the kind of themes in that changed since we've left the European Union? Well, no, because the book had nothing to do with uh, Brexit, really. Uh, it had very little to do with Britain's membership or non-membership of the EU. Uh, I say at one point in the strange death of Europe that all of the problems that I see and saw Europe going through Britain was going through and able to go through whether we were in the EU or out of it. Um, it uh, what I was describing in The Strange Death of Europe, which came out I think three years ago now, was a malaise that lies far deeper than, than Brexit. I mean, um, the issues that I raise, issues to do with immigration and integration, for instance, predated British membership of the EU and would would post-date it as well. It's, it's about the fact that these choices are in your hands and you can make good ones or bad ones now, and that, that obviously makes some difference. But the, none of the trajectories I described in that book have changed. In fact, if anything, as the news in recent days from the Greek-Turkish uh, border has showed, it's um, possibly even starting to ramp up again. As you say, are we seeing the cycle repeat itself? Because we've seen in 2015 huge levels of, of migration and then the kind of dip and now is it, it's, is it coming back? Is it going to be a forever cycle and, and this endless, endless, endless immigration? Well, uh, the point is that it, it will be until we address the issues I tried to get people to think about in that book, which I'm very glad did, did provoke a lot of thinking and discussion, not least among the public, but also who, who uh, who the reception among whom was just terrific, but also among members of the political class across the continent. Um, the book came out, I think has now come out in every European language. And uh, everywhere I go, I speak to politicians in the relevant countries. And I'm always very um, moved as well as impressed by the fact that at least there is engagement with what I've been saying. Uh, some, sometimes as a writer, you wonder if you're being read, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a pleasure when you discover you are. Um, but what I have found is, an, is the beginnings of an attempt to engage with the deeper questions I'm trying to urge people to consider. And I don't yet see a widespread enough desire to do that. The cycle you refer to, the uh, potential of endlessly going around the same thing, only occurs because we're not willing to engage at the deeper level. And I would say that that level includes very, very basic questions. The most basic of which is, can Europe be a refugee camp effectively for the entire world? The answer to that surely has to be no. But for the time being, our politicians have to pretend that the answer is sort of yes if need be. And the bigger questions just haven't gone away. You know, a, a, a statistic I've been fond of citing in the last year has been this one from a, a poll that showed that I think one third of people in sub-Saharan Africa want to move. And as I said when I cited this uh, statistic in Doha about a year ago. Uh, they don't want to go to the Middle East and there's not ch much chance of them moving in large numbers to America. There is a very significant likelihood they will move in large numbers and want to move in large numbers to Europe. And I should stress, by the way, that I mean, n I don't blame any 
person for that. Of course they would. Of course people want to make the best for themselves and for their families. And nobody can blame any individual migrant for that. We would do the same in their position. It's just that things have fallen out like this. And it happens that Europe is what it is and Sub-Saharan Africa is what it is. What do you do about that? Well, that's probably a set of questions too big for anyone to engage in at the moment, which is probably why I can't get enough people to address the questions we need to be addressing in order to have any chance of stepping out of this cycle. You've painted a rather bleak picture there of the future and of our current situation. Obviously, your book um, was all about integration and the problems with that and, and various issues, as you say, to do with mass migration into Europe over a very long period of time. But I want to get back to Brexit because I don't think that it, I don't think that one can be so sweeping and, and take it to one side and say it has no relevance or has no um, effect on that issue that you were talking about. Because if you're seeing millions of people in Britain who are seriously, seriously angry mm -hmm. with the current situation, and a huge part of that anger comes from the causes and the problems that you raise in your sure. book, surely that, and you know, for example, that the some, some material things come out of it, like a points-based immigration system, no more mass migration, no more open borders with the European sure. Union. Surely those things, and the fact that people are angry and are recognizing these problems, and maybe they're being listened to, so surely those things mean that Brexit can only be a good thing and maybe a turning point. Well, <laughs> the point is it could be, or, and, and it couldn't be. I mean, in, to my mind, the, the, the great argument for Brexit was simply we would like the keys to our own house back, thank you. Now, those keys are in the process of being returned, finally. But it doesn't mean that Britain will thereafter only be governed by sensible key owners um, or reasonable and responsible caretakers. Don't forget that the migration that made people in this country really start to worry began under a landslide elected Labour government after 1997. That wasn't the EU that did that to us. That was us that did that to us. So we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't think that. I, I strongly urge people against thinking that Brexit having been voted for and now hopefully have happened or it has happened, but hopefully also going in a good direction, um, I strongly urge people not to think that therefore they don't need, they, they sort of need, they can take their eye off these concerns. I mean, the polling shows, as you know, that um, immigration as a source of concern among the general public in Britain has gone down quite significantly in the last several years. And my interpretation of that is because, and I feel a certain amount of this myself, that, well, Brexit did something, must have done something. And so it's sort of like a release of air from a radiator. But as I say, that still means you can make all the same mistakes if you're unwilling to address the deeper underlying questions. And uh, I'm, I'm quite enthused by what has already come out on this, but but we still do, sorry to hark on about this, but we still do have this situation where it is exceptionally hard for public figures to sustain in public truths that the general public know. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Let me do it in a redux. Um, a politician from some unnamed party says, what about the poor and the children? What does the restrictionist politician say in the face of that? Now, they do have answers, but who's got a stronger hand at the moment in that argument? Who's got a stronger hand? It's still the argument for anti-restrictionism. And by the way, there's a very interesting, if I say so myself, I think point to be made about this, which is a point I've uh, lifted from my friend Eric Weinstein. Um, there is still a linkage in the political debate, the public debate, between restrictionism on immigration and xenophobia. And this is a very interesting and difficult fact. And at this stage, by the way, it's pretty pathetic that that linkage still remains. 
it should be the case by now that people can rec recognize that you may be a restrictionist on immigration and even a xenophile. I would put myself in that category, you know, it's not like I, it's not like I only want to speak to English people and eat English food and read only English literature and listen only to English music, etc., etc. I mean, come on. Come on, who really thinks that? Well, a lot of people who want to win the argument on immigration like to pretend that that's the case. I'm not a xenophobe. I'm deeply interested in the world's cultures. I spend most of my life traveling around all over the globe to find out about them and more. But I believe that it's impossible to have a system of immigration in my own country that effectively means that the world can come here if it's in need. And I think that it's an example of the terrible failure of our political discussion, our media discussion, and much more, that we are still able to have this point of totally fatuous linkage. I suppose the, the problem that you have there is that we live in a democracy and people sometimes make the wrong choices and you know those choices might conflict with what you believe and but finally Brexit is perhaps giving us that chance to be as you say the holder of those keys yeah and we can get it wrong and sure. surely that can only be a good thing. I know nothing I've said today or at any other point I think would suggest that because this country has the opportunity to vote in terrible people that means we should be run by Jean-Claude Juncker. I, I, I trust you haven't come if you have come away with that impression then I, I'm Sorry, I have to find a way to disabuse you of it later. Are we moving in the right direction on, on, the, to on the topic of immigration um, at all? Well, I mean, as you say, I mean, there, there is this interesting thing that when the public get an opportunity to sort of, when there are straightforward moments when, like the, the 2016 referendum, uh, there does seem to be a, an ability to sort of finally and we say kick the political class where it hurts because of immigration and other issues that they just didn't listen to us on. Um, uh, but I mean, everywhere in Europe, I see, I see the same trends and I see the same lack of adaptability. I mean, you, you get uh, someone, for instance, take the example of Matteo, Sal Matteo Salvini in Italy, the former uh, interior minister now out of office, but. Um, Salvini in office stopped the boats from landing, which, by the way, if, if the EU is not going to do that, if Frontex isn't going to do that, then I think a unilateral move by the Italian government is totally permissible. Well, Mr. Salvini currently has the threat of prosecutions hanging over him and the possibility of going to prison for, I think, 15 to 25 years over that. So. It's still the case, as I say, that politicians who do what must be regarded as the right thing, that is upholding the rule of law, not allowing the borders to be eroded, there must be something wrong if a politician who does that, who's popular and is voted into office, risks going to jail. Must be. And we'll see what happens on the Greek border. Uh, this is developing all the time. I see someone's just been shot by a Greek border guard. And uh, that's the sort of thing that can lead to almost anything happening. Can lead to a total loss of confidence by all the politicians. Can lead to a loss of confidence by the police. It can lead to anything. Can you, I know you, you've painted a really bleak picture again, which is fine, um, but what, what I, I find really interesting more. is that, yeah, and you, I'm sure you will do it more in this interview, what I find really interesting is that you see governments all over the world, all over Europe, that would probably tend towards more your side of the argument than the complete opposite of this sort of woke left identity politics kind of the argument. You've got Donald Trump in America, you've got Boris here, you've got Salvini and various other people, governments in Europe who again are saying similar things to you. So why are we in such a bleak situation when many, many of the governments are basically on your side? Um, well, as I say, I mean, it's not an entirely bleak situation. What I'm trying to bring across is the fact that for as long as the deep substructure arguments are not addressed, you remain incredibly vulnerable. Uh, you can put it another way. Um, this is, by the way, this is partly a res 
um, a, 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 the fault of the way in which we absorb news now. Um, if a terrible, let's say that, that, that at the Greek border tomorrow, uh, a, a Greek policeman shoots a child. Okay. You and I know that any politician who is a restrictionist on immigration is going to be basically personally blamed for, for the sort of thing that has led to that. So the most powerful people in the world may have a restrictionist view, and that view will be vulnerable to the actions of a single Greek policeman at any moment, always, versus when, for instance, the Manchester Arena bombing occurred in 2017. Who, which politicians were held that accountable for allowing a Libyan whose parents were involved with an Al-Qaeda-affiliated Islamist group who got asylum in Britain, it appears, because they had fallen out with Gaddafi because they were too Islamist for Gaddafi, but they found asylum in the UK. Tell me which British politician ever, ever had to answer for that. Give me one name of a politician in the UK who even was under some tough questioning, who even the press, who even the press said, hold this minister responsible. This happened on their watch. Did it happen? No. No. What we were told was to sing Oasis songs and to forget about it. So I, I come back to this point. If that's the field of the argument still, it doesn't matter if you had the White House. It doesn't matter if you had number 10 Downing Street. It wouldn't especially matter even if you had the European Commission in Brussels. If you're enjoying this interview, we do them every week. It's a series called Burning Questions. Don't forget to subscribe below to the Sun's YouTube channel so you can catch every single interview. It's absolutely fascinating the kind of um, the distance between having political power and let's say having social power over yes. the whole of um, our societies. Yes. Um, can you talk about some of the institutions there? And you mentioned the press, but that's perhaps one of them that leads to this um, leads to this picture that you're painting where you can't say certain things about immigration, you can't blame in, uh, those ministers who may be responsible for the things that you were talking about, you can't um, have these proper arguments because we have got to a point where cancel culture, people are ousted, there are mob hunts, witch hunts, uh, you know, mobs of crowds come, come after you. You talk about that in your next book, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But w can you talk about some of the cultural institutions which you might think uh, is causing these problems? Well, it's almost too broad uh, a question to answer. Um, my own view is that, and I explained in The Strange Death of Europe, this is, it isn't an accident or a plot. It's a result of history having happened and being interpreted the way in which it has. And that's beyond any one government or individual to turn around. You know, I mean, like, It's always hardest to argue against something that has a point, okay? Um, you're really lucky when you've got an opponent who doesn't have any justification for their views, and I've had a few of them. Um, the opponent you don't want is one that's not onto nothing. And the people who say, have said in recent years we can't, we shouldn't talk about immigration, are not entirely on to nothing, okay? Because it is true that publics, well, let me put it this way, it's true that some people in a public can turn nasty, yeah. And you wouldn't want to be the person, the politician or anyone else, who had even given a nod and a wink to that happening, you know? Like, there are people out there who actually hate, I don't know, people because of the color of their skin, for instance. I think those people are reprehensible and pitiful. But there are people like that out there. And you don't want to have a discussion on immigration that gives the nod and the wink to somebody like that to think that they're, 
superior to somebody because of their skin pigmentation or their parentage or something. So that's why it's harder than it should have been, is because particularly in Europe, and let's face it, particularly in continental Europe, it's not like I spend a certain amount of time in Germany and I'm very interested in the German political situation. It's understandable that the German political elite is worried about the rise of the right and what it sees as far-right parties. It's not like they're onto nothing in fearing that. Now, I think they interpret it wrongly. I think they should try to work out what, and I've written this before, I wrote it in The Strange Death of Europe, I think they should try to work out what is actually reprehensible far-right neo-Nazi-like ideology and what is totally should be totally legitimate mainstream conservative and centre-right right-wing thought. And in Germany, those two are being, let's say, inaccurately um, untied from each other for all sorts of reasons. But it's not, an, it's not an impossible to understand fact that the German political class might be worried about this. You know, I mean, if you if you organize an anti-immigration, anti-mass immigration protest in Munich or Dresden, you can't be sure who you're going to attract. And you can't be sure that you're going to want the support of some of the people you're going to attract. So this is, this is uh, one of the things I've shifted my mind on a bit in recent years is, I used to say, like, why don't they allow this? And I think, I can see why. I've spoken to enough politicians across the continent and seen enough of history myself to know why. I just think that they are doing it in a way which is actually going to make it worse because they have repeatedly toxified, made toxic, some opinion that should be regarded as totally mainstream. I think there's a similarity there between your argument on in the strange death of Europe and your argument in the madness of crowds because both uh, opponents of you in those two uh, arguments may have something that is true in what they're saying and especially let's talk about the madness of crowds especially those kind of identity politics woke types as it were they I mean you know black lives matter they have legitimate grievances mm -hmm. about black people getting killed by cops. That's just one example. And they're, they're, there's a whole series of these examples where, you know, as I'm sure you would agree, they come from complete grains of truth. And then uh, your argument is that they may extrapolate that and, and have the wrong solutions. I want to quote you a, uh, a Guardian review of your uh, book, which called uh, The Madness Crowds, A Right-Wing uh, Diatribe. I don't know if you've read this, this review, but I want, I want your response to it. It says, scratch beneath the surface, though, and his account of recent history is clear. Authorised by left-wing academics, minority groups have been concocting conflict and hatred out of thin air, polluting an otherwise harmonious society for their own gratification. And I think that also goes down to what you've just mentioned there about the kind of history of where these views come from. It's not just something that's recent phenomenon, it's not just something that affects one institution like the BBC, for example, or another, but it has this whole kind of social history and it's all built up to the situation mm. now. Can you respond to that? Is that an accurate, accurate view of where you think these problems have come from in the that past? That was the Guardian review. That was, was the Guardian. Surprisingly lucid writing for the Guardian. Um, well, by the way, there's a, um, I should mention that there's a, slight, uh, there's a difference between, by the way, among other things, I and mean, obviously the madness of crowds is about all the identity politics madness that's going on at the moment, but. Um, there's a tonal difference that quite a lot of readers have noticed between these books. The Strange Death of Europe is, a, is in many ways a very bleak book um, because I looked at the facts in the face and I found them bleak. Um, the Madness of Crowds is, is a f if I say so myself, quite a funny book. I did the audio book myself and I did an awful lot of laughing. Um, not actually, I should stress, as I did to the sound engineers, they're not because of the, any of my jokes particularly, but because of the craziness of the things that I'm running The absurdities, at. yeah. And um, there's even a difference when I talk about it, and I'm conscious even now, that, um, that I'm 
not only amused but much more positive about the targets I'm talking about in the madness of crowds. And that's because I think this is eminently winnable. Okay? Uh, um, uh, when the facts are bleak, it makes me quite bleak. When, when an argument is eminently winnable, I cheer up <laughs> because I see, I see the possibility of imminent victory. I, I don't think that the, the madnesses that I write about in the madness of crowds are madness that's been going on around sexual identity and uh, um, you know, sexual, sexuality. The madness that's gone around about the relations between the sexes, between men and women. The madness about race in recent years and especially the madness about trans. I, I don't think these, I don't think my opponents are gonna win. I don't think they're gonna persuade enough people that, you know, physical, physical um, uh, um, and anatomical facts are of no relevance. I don't think they're going to manage it. I sort of pity them for trying. I sort of admire them in a way for trying. It's extraordinary to watch people argue in face of the facts. But, um, but uh, the, uh, to go back to the, the thing you cited, yeah, I think that what, what, I, what I lay out is the fact that th these are, the madnesses I described in Madness of Crowds are sort of invented, yes. I mean, they're not very natural ph phenomena. Um, you, you need to be educated into stupidity of this kind. Nobody of their own volition would say that, you know, sex is not sex but gender and gender is a social construct. Like, you, you have to have taken out loans or your parents have to have remortgaged the house in order for you to go away and college, to college and become that stupid. You know, you have to be taught that. Um, I'd be surprised if anyone heard it down the pub, you know, or in their social life from anyone who hasn't had the misfortune of being fed gender queer studies theory at some, you know, impossibly bad college somewhere in UK or America. Um, so I think people are taught this stuff, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and I think that the consequence is that it's pulling us apart. I think it's, I think that, the, you know, one of the ways I, 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 I'm trying in the discussions around this, I'm doing a lot of public discussions about this, as you know, um, doing a tour of the UK in the next couple of months with comedian Andrew Doyle. Um, and one of the ways I'm trying to encourage m myself well, and others to think about this is to say, what do we agree on? Now, I, I reckon that one of the things we agree on in this society pretty much is, certainly my own view, nobody should ever be held back from achieving anything they can achieve if they have the right competencies because of some trait that they have no say in. So no young woman should be prevented from doing any job she is competent at doing or performing any task she is competent at performing because she happens to be a woman. And the same, if it's worth saying, probably is with a man. Um, nobody should be prevented from or in any way held back from what they can do because they happen to be gay, or they happen to be black, or anything like that. It's, it's, it's an absurdity, as well as a sort of moral offense, among much else. But there is a massive difference of opinion going on about, first of all, the extent to which that remains an issue in our societies. Some people see it as some remaining issue in certain places, I'd be among them. And some people see it as being a demonstration of a system that is so oppressive, patriarchal, racist, and much more, that you have to tilt over the whole damn thing and start again. I'm not with them. And I think we also have, this is a long answer to your question, but. I think we also have the problem of, of, of the media age that we are in. The, I don't mean the media, the media, I mean the way in which we absorb information, 
which means that a bad thing happening in one country can be portrayed as if it is symptomatic not just of that country but of all developed countries. So, you know, uh, the uh, um, vaguely literate review you just quoted to me, might cite, 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 you say cite, it cites Black Lives Matter. Now, you see, Black Lives Matter is a response to a very specific situation in America. There, there's a dispute to be had about cases like this in America. And there are people who claim that when one police officer does something wrong in America, it is a demonstration of the innate remaining racism in America. Okay, that's a specific argument in America. Does it mean that we live in countries like not just America, but Britain and all other democracies in an incredibly racist system and so on? I just, it's one of the ones that there may be something in it, but not that much. And if you asked and sure, how, how do you have the confidence to say that? I'd give two answers, just for starters. The first, people come here. People come here. They want to come to America from all over the world. They want to come to Britain from all over the world. If we were unusually or excessively racist countries, that simply would not be the case. You did not see large numbers of people trying to break into Nazi Germany in the 1930s. There's a reason. Likewise, there is a reason why the world wants to come to Britain and America. So I refuse to hear the argument. I refuse to believe or be cajoled into the argument that is being made by some of the people trying to whip up race hatred in our own era in their own particular way. And the second example I would give is, you know, maybe there aren't quotient per capita satisfactory representations at every board level in every company in Britain or America of sexual minorities, women, and racial minorities, and trans people. But you know, um, countries like Britain and America are very unlike countries like, say, China and India in all sorts of ways. And let me give you one example of why. You can, and people do, from every imaginable background, get to the absolute top of British society. It's something of which I'm very proud I think most British people are very proud. That's not the case in China. It's not the case in India. Look at the Indian or Chinese governments. Do you see them as, you know, rather remarkably multicultural? Or female dominated? Or anything else? No. I'm not saying we can't do things better. But the idea that there's nowhere worse is such a dishonest thing to claim that I do judge the people who make those claims. And I wonder whether they're talking about my society as critics wishing to improve it or as enemies wishing to destroy it. Do you know what I find really hard to argue against when they make their arguments and I'll give you two examples of this. One, I was at an event, um, a book, it was a book launch um, <laughs> about, uh, what was it even about? The, about a World War II book and there's this woman there I met, she was Australian, she came up to me, this was in London and she said, we, after, got, after got chatting for a while, she said, um, I'm Australian and I've been here for a few years and I feel that British people don't want to be friends with me. And I said, oh, well, why do, you, why do you say that? Why do you say that? She said, well, because I'm Australian and I think that British people don't want to accept me because I'm Australian. I think that they are being, in their own way, racist towards me. And she said, I've spoken to many Australian people like, uh, who say similar things. I said, wow, I would never personally do that to an Australian. I would never personally. Sure. Uh, what an odd situation for you to be in. And for me, it was like, wow, how can that be the case? Um, and it, that's the hardest thing because you can come to someone and they say, well, my experiences show, well, actually, sure. I've grown up and I've had people hold racist abuse of me. I've had all these terrible experiences. And it's like, well, is our society racist? That's, that, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Two, they say it's invisible. They say, you're racist, but you don't even know it. And then you go, am I racist? Is the decisions that I'm making every single day racist somehow? Or is it not? 
and, that, and they say this, this permeates throughout the whole of society. You, you don't even know if you're being racist because you, know, you, come, up, you come from white privilege, you come sure. from a white background. So those two things, people having their own experiences which are perfectly legitimate, I'm sure very much are true in their own cases. And also they say, well, these things are invisible. So how could you possibly say that they don't exist? Um, several things. Firstly, let's take your Australian woman because she's useful because I assume that we can keep race out of it, or at least she's we white, can keep yeah. skin pigmentation out of it, OK? Um, there might be lots of reasons why she's found that to be the case. I, I, I love Australia, incidentally, and I have a lot of Australian friends who I may be about to lose. But let me give you a couple of examples of what else might be going on. It may be that, for instance, she's a bit loud and forward for people here. It's possible. I'm not saying it's the case with everyone, but it's possible. It's possible she's, that some British people still don't find, let's say, a particular type of Australian entirely to their taste. It's impossible to do this without making wild generalizations. Let's, let's, let's say, for instance, she, I mean, I know a lot of good Aussies, including a good, lot of good Aussie drinkers. Let's say she's a good Aussie drinker. She who, was. Right, OK, good. So I'm not onto nothing. Who, when she gets drunk, gets drunk in a particular way, and it's not completely to the taste of British drinking styles, OK? Maybe that's why. Now, is that racism? No, it's a judgment of a kind. Is it a nice judgment? Not for her, no. Um, I can imagine scenarios. I, I, I will refrain from being too graphic about it, but I can imagine a scenario where uh, I'm uh, in Australia and I find it slightly hard to make Australian friends. For, I don't think I would particularly, but I can imagine this scenario. Some people might think he's a bit of a stuck-up Brit. He's not that, you know, he's not very forthcoming. He doesn't tell me much about his life when we have conversations after a friendship of five minutes. For instance, um, these things are hard. And I think it's not correct to interpret that as a racism thing. There are several things that are going on here, and this gets to the second point you make. Um, I think our understanding of this is rather subtly but interestingly off. Um, it's possible, it's quite likely we have prejudices that we don't want to face up to, and that we have things going on in our heads that, are, that we're not proud of. Um, and Something like racism exists in every society on Earth. I mean, is there racism across Africa? You bet. Look at the riots in South Africa a few years ago, not caused by white people hating black people, but by black South Africans turning on black Africans from a neighboring country who they didn't like, didn't think should be there. This isn't a noble instinct. This is one of the most savage and base instincts of our species. Um, believing that only we suffer from it and that it's, that it's sort of a terminal condition of the white Western European, particularly male, is an unfair characterization of it. Um, I regard racism as among, our, among much else as being an exceptionally ugly human instinct. But it's, it's like other ugly human instincts. Could you eradicate it entirely and completely? Probably not. Has anyone done a better job of trying that than us? Probably not. So I remain, I would go back to this point. I remain suspicious of people who wish to portray the countries that are visibly and provably struggling with that instinct and try, trying to at least minimizing it and minimizing it pretty damn well. I remain suspicious of the people who portray those societies in an especially racist light, you know. Go to any number of other countries around the world, as I have been. I've traveled exceptionally widely on every continent in my life. 
go to any other place and report back to me about racism there and then tell me that it's us that's got a problem when it's provably better than anywhere else. Here's another area where I think they have a pretty strong argument and it, you know, hopefully you're going to dispel my... The other uh, one wasn't that strong. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of an emotional argument they make sure. in the racism one, which I think is the why it works. It, it, it appeals to your kind of emotive... Oh, by the way, I should have said, sorry, yeah, the appeal to self. Yeah. Of course, we've also got to be very suspicious of that when people say, I'm correct and you're wrong, although you don't know how. You're, they're asking you to take this on trust, which I wouldn't do. I think it creates a self-doubt in your, you know, because sure. you didn't have that experience and it's like, well, you know, that's why I think it's strong. It may not be strong materialistically, but it's strong emotively. And, that, and again, I want to go on to another emotive argument that I find quite strong. You probably don't. But please clear my doubts. Um, I, am a, I have a childish love of history. I mean, it's something, a big passion why childish? of mine. Well, I mean, a romantic love of history is probably a better way of putting better it. Better word. Rather than a rash, uh, sort of, a, it's rather irrational, I would say. Anyway, um, so therefore, I think that um, this argument about the judgment of history and the eyes of history looking at the people, looking at our conversations now in the future is interesting. Because, and, this, and you talk about this in your book a little bit, you talk about the civil rights movements of the, the 1960s, for example, were fantastic movements, which we can all agree now, looking back on them, those arguing for civil rights were the right people. They were in the right of history. And those people, the segregationists, the homophobes, and the people in power at that time were completely wrong and you know, absolutely were wrong. Now we come to today, and I know that you'll have, you'll have some fantastic arguments against this, but it's difficult to know because they make this argument, for example, with trans rights, that you, sir, are simply a segregationist from the 1960s, but equivalent to today. You are the same people who said that gay people shouldn't have those rights. You are the same people who, were who we can look back on and now and say you were completely wrong. How do we draw the line to say, well, actually, this movement has gone too far? How do we know when that movement has gone too far without the benefit of hindsight? I'd suggest that you have at least two good things on your side that you should use as much as possible first is your eyes, and the second is your reason. I'm very suspicious of people who pretend that they have an exclusive tap-in to the continuum of history. That they, uniquely, have witnessed not just each step of the past, but each step of the future. There's a, a deep underlying fallacy at work there, which is worth pointing out first, which is possibly, among other things, the education that you've had the misfortune of imbibing yourself. I, I don't blame you individually. I think almost everybody in Britain and indeed in most of the Western world has imbibed this. But this is the narrative of history as a narrative of emancipation. So that the story of our species is one of just getting freer and freer. And that when we were in caves, Trans people just had the misfortune of not having access to clinics. And, and the gay cavemen just didn't have anywhere to hang out. And the women, cave women, who wanted to hunt, just weren't allowed. They were held back from the hunting. And the women who wanted to go and gather fire were not allowed. And, and happily, over a certain period of time, all these wrongs have been gradually righted and everyone has become freer and freer till we are where we are now. And now there may be just a few more things to free up and then we are in nirvana. Okay, that's the interpretation of history that has been taught for a generation in Britain and in other countries and I think it's a pathetic fallacy. I think it's an unbelievable reduction of history uh, and a deep misinterpretation of what history is. Um, there are people who, for instance, still portray the 20th century as a history of emancipation. We had the suffragettes, we had the gay rights movement, we had uh, the civil rights movement. And these are the bits of history that we need to learn from and, and copy. And yes, we also saw two world wars that did more than anything in human history to 
nearly wipe us out. Where do we fit that into that story? You know, how the hell do you make that work? They don't. That's a different story somehow. Because the real story we want to concentrate on is the history of emancipation. It, it, by the way, a history in which, in particular in America, people are taught that the main reason that we fought World War II was to stop the Nazis persecuting the Jews. Flat out wrong. Flat out wrong. But that's the sort of thing you need to do. You need to manipulate history in order to fit into the interpretation of history that you've already put over it. So the first thing is that. The second is, I said to you, you should use your eyes and use your reason. Let's just, let's take the gay one first. Let's do the gay versus trans. Like, uh, there was some, there is some pathetic conservative party gay group who are affiliated with the Conservative Party, who knows about these people, who, who cares? But there's some, you know, official gays. On Twitter or something. Yeah, yeah. they may even have a real existence. And uh, the official gays of the Conservative Party wrote the other week when I wrote something critical about some of the, oh, about this sinister children trans movement mermaids. Uh, uh, this uh, gay official legacy conservative thing said, um, that I was just saying about the trans, what people have said about the gays. And this is an example of people incapable of using their heads. Uh, and I'll tell you one reason why, to begin with. The gay rights movement and the gay liberation movement uh, was asking one thing in particular of the rest of society. It was saying, we exist, we always have existed, and we're just asking you to allow us to get on with our lives and to pursue life and indeed love in the way we have to do it. And you don't need to change anything. You don't need to change anything. You just need to allow us to be what we are. And the moral force of that argument in the end was, was accepted. Now, I don't deny that the trans movement, I write about this in Manners of Crowds, that the, tra the trans movement has learned quite a lot, is trying to learn quite a lot from the gay rights movement, and is trying to copy what was successful in it. That's why they're trying to portray themselves less as sexual beings than as totally non-sexual beings, and there's a whole fascinating and rather gynecological uh, avenue I can go into on that. But that, th that is, the, the trans movement is not doing what the gay movement says. It's saying... We are here, we have always been here, to which I say, possibly. And then, and you need to change a lot to get around that. So imagine if the gay rights movement had said, we're here, we're queer, and there's no such thing as penises or vaginas. You said, what? You, you, you're saying what? We're here, we're queer, but women don't exist. Ooh. Not sure we can give you that one, guys. We're here, we're queer, and you've got to totally change the language. Oh. Not sure we can do that. Okay? That's the first thing. That's the first thing. The second thing that's worth highlighting on that to disabuse you of the notion you you suggested at the start is, if we actually, instead of doing this from this, you know, liberation history interpretation and then people are whatever you th they claim they are, how about using our heads a bit? How about, for instance, actually interrogating questions like trans children, you know? Uh, uh, the week in which we're speaking, there's news that's just come out of another case of a person who was believed to be a trans child taking legal action against the Tavistock Clinic in London. By the way, I, I predicted all of this in the madness of crowds. I said this was going to be start to happen. This was going to start happening. I predicted that the trans thing will end up falling apart in a horrible number of litigations, and this is this is this is happening. This this uh, young person who was put on hormone blockers, among other things, 
says, it just all happened so fast. Nobody asked me enough questions. And I've heard this firsthand from lots of people I've interviewed, exactly the same thing. That's why I knew it was coming. Now, if somebody says to you, if you question whether trans children exist, you are being transphobic, anti-trans, you're disappearing trans people, you're making, gay, you're making trans people kill themselves or other people kill trans people, sure, you might back off from the argument. Should you? No. No, you shouldn't. You should look at that. You should use your head. You should use your reason. You shouldn't be subject to moral blackmail. I don't like the tone of voice in any way that this is described in. I don't like the teenage girl suicidal tone of do what I want or I might harm myself. I don't think that's acceptable in a society any more than it's tolerable in an individual. Blackmailing everybody else in society with the possibility of your own self-harm, no, no. And there need to be more people who say, no, we are going to look at this seriously. We do not believe that doing a mastectomy on a child or promising a child a mastectomy is simply the latest portion of the civil rights movement which we have to agree to. No. And I don't think that people should be bullied into this. Again, pretty bleak picture there of the, of the trans movement, absolutely. Oh, and uh, realistic, there, there I was, say. You may say that. And there's a video, um, on, <laughs> there's a video on Twitter of um, uh, a, a, a young girl and a trans person dancing. Have you seen this video? Dancing no. around them. Maybe, perhaps I shouldn't ask this question if you haven't seen it. Go, the video. go but, on. No. Uh, basically, the, the, the question is that, that this, this trans person is, is uh, making a sexual dance around this young, I would say, toddler girl um, at this party. And it's gone viral on Twitter because a lot of people are saying, well, why did no one intervene? Why was this allowed to happen? Why has this suddenly become acceptable? And my question to you is, why? Because surely 10 years ago, 20 years ago, adults at that party perhaps would have thought this isn't necessarily the best thing in the world for a young child to experience. Could I answer that by going a, to quite, this is quite a deep level of our species. We are deeply herd animals. To such an extent that we pick off people who are outside of the herd. We target them. What's happen what happens on social media, which we talk about as if it's a new phenomenon, is one of the oldest phenomena of our species, one of the most deeply ingrained phenomena. We pretend that we like dissidents, and we don't. Every society crushes it, if they can, for as long as they can. Every group does it. Look at the Catholic Church. Look at the Catholic Church. There were so many people who permitted what we agreed was one of the worst things that anyone could do, which was to harm a child. And good people, good people, thought it was more important to cover that up and even risk letting it go on than to allow a PR blow to occur against the Catholic Church. Were they bad people, the people who did this? No, they're the same people as everybody else. They were protecting what they regarded as sacred. Sacred values exist always. The interesting question is, how do you identify what they are in your own time? And do you allow people to run in any way against them? Now, 50 years ago, the church might have been regarded as one of the institutions so important to protect that you would allow morally reprehensible things to be done and to be covered up in order to protect the institution. We might say, I don't want to take a low blow against a media competitor of yours, but we might say that the same thing existed in the BBC light entertainment division for quite a long time. 
I don't doubt, by the way, that the same thing has happened in some degree in different areas, in every media organization in the world, as in every other effectively closed group. We protect ourselves in this way. Now, it happens that one of the sacred values of our own age, alongside anti-homophobia, anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-misogyny, and so on, has become trans, where trans people have, slightly like gay people, become this magical, fairy, pixie dust people who the gods have graciously granted us, by the way, which has a, um, a long lineage in, in world history. I mean, I say world history because every country has versions of it, so it's obviously quite deeply ingrained in us, this. But it's, it's a particular thing in our own era, and there are various views about why that is. Camille Paglia says that it's something that happens at the end of civilization, that we become particularly interested in crossing across sexes, why, why the late Roman antiquity was particularly interested in hermaphroditism, and, and so on. There are lots of interesting explanations for why it might be the case. But at the moment, trans is one of the sacred values of our time. So if you see something in a social context which even goes against a very deep feeling of your own morality, protect the children, perhaps the deepest instinct we should, could have, certainly the most important one to have, and one of the new sacred values is dancing around it, most, well, most, a lot of people will allow the current sacred value to override their deep moral instinct. And then years later, when all stands in a different light, they will feel shame about that. As somebody who doesn't have a particular or has a slightly unusual, like a lot of people do, I, do an un, I don't have no herd instinct. Of course I have, some will do. But as, as somebody who has a slightly lower herd instinct on a lot of things, you know, I'm, my own opinion is enough for me. I don't care if I'm the only one who holds it. Um, I recognize that for the time being, I can see which are the things that we are making into our gods and I can see the ones that I know we are going to be embarrassed by in our own lifetimes. And I think that the self-appointed task of people like me then in an era like this is to identify those and try to get people off them as early as we can. So let's have a reasonable discussion about the reasonable things that might be existing in trans and let's do that before we do mastectomies on the young. I want to delve into yourself in a minute, uh, talking about, as you just mentioned there, your kind of fire, your kind of purpose on this earth, why you spend so much time and energy and passion um, talking about the issues that you do. Um, but before we do that, I, uh, I want to ask a very brief, if you could answer very briefly, um, and then we'll talk about some perhaps more happy uh, topics to end the interview on because I like to end the interview on a, on a more happy and uh, optimistic note. I'm a bit of a na naive optimist. Um, is our society at the end of days? Are we facing that catastrophe that Rome, that Rome had, for example? Um, there is no short answer to that. There are different views on this and I'm not sure entirely which one I subscribe to. The normal point to make is that the Roman Empire, it's four centuries between the reign of Nero and the collapse of the empire. And when people say this can't go on, you have to be very careful about what this is and what can't is doing in that sentence. Um, things can go on an awful long time you know, um, in an allegedly unsustainable manner. I think that 
I think there is also an inbuilt problem. I, you said a short answer, but it's impossible to answer a point on civilization. As brief as possible. Too brief. <laughs> I think there's also the problem of what a friend of mine in the tech world describes as the, the risk of self-fulfilling prophecy on these sorts of things. Say that our civilization is exhausted and tired, and you might make it so. Um, uh, look, there's a new book about this that I've just been reviewing uh, that diagnoses this society as being sort of decadent. And of course, the misunderstanding about decadence is that it's, uh, well, there's lots of problems about the word now. But um, there, is an, there is a perception that decadence immediately leads to collapse and therefore to change and renewal, which is not entirely true historically. We tend to think of fin de siècle Paris or uh, Weimar Germany, you know. Um, but actually, um, decadence uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is, is something that can be sustained for an awfully long time. Um, I'm not making a moral judgment when I say decadence, by the way. I'm saying that things like the very bad signs in our own society of having, for instance, the biggest, most powerful and richest entertainment complex that the world has ever seen, pumping out film after unwatchable film in which characters invented for cartoon books two or three generations ago now are endlessly cycled around in hybrid formats, battling each other or with each other against another foe invented a couple of generations ago. The point being, a society that makes bad films may not be decadent, but one that just keeps repeating the same material almost certainly is. Um, so I can see that, I can see, and, and when I'm given the opportunity, I can speak about the chances of renewal, and I can see exactly what they are. And I can also see the cycle of endless repetition and lack of creativity and lack of purpose and lack of drive, which I fear is one of the distinguishing factors of our age, but then you could say that it is in each age until something new is born. I want to get back to uh, smiley, happy Douglas, who I saw earlier in the interview talking about um, how this is a fight that we can win. Um, so can you give people uh, some reasons to be optimistic? Why, uh, why should we opt be optimistic about this fight? Because it is a winnable one. Well, by the way, the first thing I should say, the reason to be optimistic is because of this. I mean. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are the luckiest people in history. You know, my uh, late friend Clive James once said to me, you know, he said, his generation, he was born in 1939, and he said, um, you know that Buster Keaton film, <coughs> where Buster Keaton, the black and white film, where Buster Keaton's standing in the doorway, and the, it turns out that the thing behind him that looks like a house is a, cut out to a scenery set and it comes, I can't remember which movie it's in, and it f starts to fall forward and you remember it goes all the way over and it crashes the door and he's standing in the doorway and misses him. And Clive said to me once, you know, um, that was my generation. He said the whole damn house fell in and it missed us. And that was, he was right, to have been born then, to have missed the war, to have benefited from the fruits of post-war peace and prosperity was incredible luck. Unprecedented in human history, really. And we, who come after that, have even more luck. The chance of us needing, for instance, to be signed up and recruited in an army and fighting people hand to hand till one of us dies is not impossible, but it's very small. We live in, in cities where, when there isn't growth, we think it's unnatural. We live in societies so free that we spend an inordinate amount of our time talking about our oppression. There are people who, who are wanting for things, of course. I think that's perennial. Um, and we have people in, we have people who are homeless and people who can't eat. 
but the society is set up in such a way that we don't have starving everywhere and we have help for people and we have a situation we moan about but where the ill can get treated without needing to pay anything and we have access on small devices in our pockets to everything that has been written, said, composed and sung in a way that our forebears would have found impossible to imagine in a lifetime. So we have the greatest luck in human history. And the question I have about that is, then why aren't we doing more? And that's what I'd like us all to be thinking about is, and this is why I'm sorry to go back and beat you up a little bit more about this, but your, your narrative of oppression and, um, and escape from oppression history may have stuck us in this idea that that's the most important thing we focus on. Like what we focus on is more and more emancipation. And my suspicion is that to the extent that that was certainly worth doing in certain places, that storyline may have been running down or out or there's not that much more to do. I don't want to sound complacent on this, but that there, but that, that story has had its time and that a new story of equal fire and significance that arouses similar passions in a different direction needs to be released. And that it could be if we weren't stuck on defunct track lines. So we have a hell of a lot to be positive about and grateful for. If nothing else, the opportunity that we're the one era in history where you can grouse about your lot and people listen to you. I think in my defense, it's a pretty damn uh, uh, powerful narrative, that one that one, sure. that one is taught. Um, so You're right. Uh, and, uh, and you are taught it, and I was taught it, and we all, uh, you know, young people today, all come <laughs> out of school with these, with the, all come out of school with these um, very, very similar mindsets sure. to do with history. And it's something, one, one, when I, I didn't go to university, but when I left school, and you read history books, different history books, the ones that you aren't taught, it's absolutely fascinating to see um, perhaps reality versus what the narrative they, t they teach you. By the and way, isn't that wonderful when that happens? Mm. It's, a, it's a brilliant uh, feeling and it's like opening your eyes to a whole new world, which is uh, why I also love doing these interviews because I learn so much. And I want to finish the interview, I know we're running out of time, um, about you and yourself. And I think that you don't talk about yourself very much and I understand why because it's all about different uh, bigger issues than you. But I want to understand and I think lots of people will be curious about this. Where does the, this come from, this brilliant intellect? You are one of the biggest, if I may say, intellects of our time in the Western world. I think that's pretty, pretty much true. You've sold millions of, the, of your books. You've, got, you've obviously hit on something that people were interested in, but where does it come from within you? Talk about your background and, and your, where, does this, where do you think this comes from? Well, if I can say so first, by the way, that the thing of not talking about myself much is, is deliberate for various reasons. But one is that I, I honestly was either trained or trained myself to believe that arguments from self were not that valid, which turns out to be exactly contrary to the main belief of the era, which is that arguments from self are the most valid <laughs> thing, and in fact, maybe the only valid thing. So. But I honestly don't believe that. I don't, I, don't, I don't find arguments from self persuasive. And in fact, I, fi I feel a certain contempt for them, to tell the truth. Um, and, and I think there's, by the way, there's a deeper reason for that, which is that I do believe that we're more than our characteristics. And I do believe that we're more than our life experience. So that when somebody says, let me tell you about me, I think that is, that can be very interesting. 
But there are also more interesting things than you, you know? And it would be like, you know, one of the things in us that I say somewhere, I think, in the matters of crowd, we, we, we revolt against ourselves when described merely as consumers, for instance. And that's because that doesn't do it for us. And I suggest that people feel that same element of revolt about being described just as a woman or a man. What do you as a woman think about this? Excuse me. What do you as a gay think about this? What do you as a, a black person or person of color think about this? I, I, I encourage people to have some revolt against that because it's not the essence of what we are and what we can do with our lives and what we can achieve. Um, what uh, I'm not in a good position to say why I'm what I am. I'm probably in the worst position. I could defer to almost any expert in the world other than myself on that subject. Um, but um, there are certain things I know by now about what drives me. I know I'm driven by a dislike of lies and untruths. I find there to be something not just irritating but demeaning about them. Uh, I know I'm driven by I'm driven by an attraction to difficult things. That's definite. I know that. One of my earlier books was on one of the ugliest things that happened in the Northern Ireland conflict, in which I went into in infinite detail. And I remember a friend was saying, well, why would you have done this book next? And I was like, because it's so difficult, because it's so painful and ugly and needs to be looked at. But I suppose, yes, the things which make other people sometimes turn away and go, oh, why do you want to do that? Um, but I am interested in, you know, I'm interested in, in people and I'm interested in our time. And I'm interested in looking at what we're going through as if we'd already gone through it. Um, taking a step back and seeing what's actually motivating us and driving us. And I'm just interested in the whole thing, you know, I, I never feel like I can read enough or know enough or have met enough people or have traveled to enough places. You know, I said to a friend recently, you know, the interesting thing about traveling is even the boring places are interesting because it's interesting nothing's happening there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say what they are, of course, those boring places because I don't need to make any more enemies. I'm going to drag this out of you, Douglas. I'm going to drag this out of you. I want to know some specific anecdotes, an, uh, anecdotes about, about you. Right, you have this in, innate uh, curiosity, it seems to me. That seems to be one thing that drives you. You love going around the world. You love experiencing, meeting new people. You, you, you're so curious about everything. That must have come from somewhere. Did, were you curious as a child? Did you ask questions to the waiter did, in the restaurant? Did you go out there and speak to the lollipop man? I mean, what was, what was going on? Did, did this always happen, or did it sort of was a gradual journey? Um, I always wanted to get out there into the world. I always wanted that. I wanted to see as much as possible. And the truth is that at the deepest level I can explain about myself, it's because I never wanted to miss a thing. I never wanted to miss a thing. Whatever it was that we can see and go through and try to understand. I wanted to see and go through and try to understand. It's probably one of the reasons why throughout my life I've always had most of my friends an awful lot older than me. It has the disadvantage, among other things, of going to more funerals than one would like to go to. But it has the incalculable advantage of meaning that you are learning from people who know more than you've known yourself. I ca it's one of the things I can never understand that more people don't do. I can never understand why people only have friends of their age group. Why wouldn't you want to have a better sweep and understanding? You know? So probably that has always been there, yeah. And 
you know, I, I, obviously most people are not like that. Um, maybe it's better for the world that they're not. I don't know. Um, but it, it is. I don't. I'm not. I'm not joking about this. It is incredibly hard to work out what actually fires you up. But I don't think I'm that unusual. Um, I'm just incredibly lucky, among other things, that I've been able to write all my life. I've never been beholden to anyone or anything. I've made a career, I've made a living without having to tell untruths. And I, I wish everyone had the same freedom. And on that, Douglas Murray, thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure.